Philip Green, Chairman and CEO of Colin Frost Bankers is here with us this morning. Phil joined Colin Frost organization in July 1980 and served in numerous managerial positions in the company's finance division before being named CFO in 1995, a position he held in 2015 when he was named president of Colin Frost. He became chairman and CEO in 2016. And during Green's tenure, Frost has become one of the nation's 50 largest banks, which will be important in the conversation here today, I imagine increased its common stock dividend for 28 consecutive years, launched large expansion projects that nearly doubled the number of locations in the Houston region and will triple the number of locations in North Texas. He's helped small businesses with more than 32,000 PPP loans to keep them afloat during the pandemic. Recently became the first bank to announce it would pass an interest rate increase along to depositors earned more Greenwich Excellence Awards for service and business clients than any other bank nationwide for five consecutive years, received the highest ranking in customer satisfaction in Texas, and was named to Frost Magazine's list America's 100 Best Banks. So quite, quite some accomplishments and congratulations to Phil and Frost, and we're excited to have you here today. So Phil will be joined by Dean Daniel Pollan, the John V. Roach Dean of the Neely School of Business and Professor of Entrepreneurship and Innovation. So Dean Pollan joined the Neely School about three years ago and came to us uh, from the University of Oklahoma where he served as Dean of the Price School of Business. Uh, before joining OU, Dean Pollan worked for a global cons consultancy firm, McKinsey, um, and also worked in private equity with Hicks, Muse, Tate, and First. Dean Pullen is a visionary leader, currently leading us in the development of an ambitious five-year strategic plan that focuses on innovation, leadership, and the whole student development. And under his leadership, as we talked about already, we've become the top 20 undergraduate program in the US, number one energy MBA, number one executive MBA, and number four full-time MBA in Texas. We are also one of the top 10 business schools to watch. So, welcome. Glad you can be part of this journey with us. And I will turn the floor over to you, my friend. As Jessica mentioned, you know, Frost is one of you know, several outstanding companies that are really co-investing in, in our progress. And, and, and like Frost, uh, so many other great companies are helping us convene community that's increasing the visibility of the Neely School of Business, uh, creating uh, stronger awareness of the nature and quality of our talent, and, and is driving some of these amazing outcomes. So in addition to Frost, who's our platinum sponsor, I also want to thank um, our gold sponsor, the Fort Worth Business Press. It's really been a great partner in getting the narrative out. Um, our silver sponsors, uh, Esri, Lindbeck, and the Balcom Agency, uh, and our bronze sponsors, Acme Brook, Dunaway, and uh, the good folks at McDonald Sanders. Uh, let's thank in the round all of our sponsors. <laughs> Okay, Philip, so uh, graduation's two weeks away. It's been so nice to get back to uh, bringing people together. We've had an outstanding lineup uh, for our Tandy Executive Speaker Series, and this is the capstone, right? This is our final exam. And I, um, uh, I've been struck by the prior conversations that each and every one of them has, has turned to the topic of, of change and innovation. And I know Frost well enough to know that innovation is at the forefront of everything you do, you know, not just from a technological perspective, but um, you know, how, how you care for your customers, your processes, how you interface with your, your communities. And so if you could just talk a little bit about you know, your leadership or your outlook on how you've navigated you know, Frost through uh, this period of accelerated change, certainly over the last two years, but even, even before that. Um, you know, you're known as a strong, innovative leader. Um, so talk to us a little bit about how you've done that, what might have prepared you for that task, um, and a little bit about your own personal journey. Well, thanks, Dean. Uh, first of all, I, I want to just thank Pam. Uh, great career, Frost, and just want to echo um, what, what you said, and, and great to recognize her. You know, um, it's like they say, you tell the truth, you don't ever remember what you said, right? <laughs> And so I'll just be honest with you. The, uh, as far as my, my personal journey, I think I'm a, sort of an unlikely person to be here uh, in this seat, you know, uh, leading Frost right now, uh, actually. The, um, 
you know, my dad was, uh, you know, brilliant guy, but he wasn't able to finish middle school because of his economic situation. I'm the first person in my family to, uh, to graduate from college. Uh, I really didn't plan on going to college. Uh, I had no interest. I was going to be a musician. I want to go out to California and see what I could do back in that period of time in the, uh, in the 70s and uh, make my way out there. Um, I, um, I actually came to, to, to uh, faith in Christ back when I was 18, and it sort of changed some perspectives that I had. And one of the things I decided, well, I'll give this college thing a try. And uh, I, wouldn't be a, I wouldn't be the model student that you'd want to hire back in high school, I'll just tell you that. But the uh, best thing I did in high school was I met that lady out there, Sandy Green, <laughs> who, uh, who we've been together now, married for 46 years and together for 50. <laughs> Six, six kids, 11 grandkids right now, right? So anyway, I decided I'd, I'd try, try college, and um, after thinking, I might go into law, I ended up in, in, in accounting and, and, and did okay there. So started out in accounting and then went, went to Frost, who was a client of mine. For, I worked there about three years. So I've been there 42 years, and uh, so I've seen a lot of change. So as far as preparing for the kind of change we see today, I'm not sure anything did that specifically other than being at the place with as great a leaders that I've come, that I've followed. Uh, they, they taught you about our culture, and our culture is what endures. And it's, uh, you were a 154-year-old company. We've been through two world wars, a global pandemic, the Great Depression, the Great Financial Crisis, the money panic of the 19. Uh, early 1900s, uh, all those things, and and what what sustains the company is its commitment to its culture and its core values, and those really have been enduring, and that, that's what I think is has really helped us more than anything as we've navigated this change. When you talk about the culture and the core values, how do you how do you live those, or um, how do you thread those through? Um, you know, your day-to-day -day execution of your plan? You know, the, um, the, the, the work around culture is constant, and it has to be in everything you do. We, um, we have a, a great effort around instilling what that culture means in terms of materials and work that we've done to codify it over time and operationalize it. But um, unless our employees see it put to work day to day in action, when it actually costs you money to follow it, it doesn't really mean much. And that's, you know, those are the things that I saw. As I was a young banker when I came to work at Frost in 1980, it tells you I've been around a long time. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we had about 18 months worth of good, good years. I mean, good times in banking. And then you had the energy crisis that happened and Texas downturned for 10 years. So I saw Tom Frost, I saw Dick Evans and those people make decisions that uh, were for the long term and um, that were hard decisions to make in the interest of the long term uh, benefit of our depositors, our shareholders and our employees. And, and those kind of things stick with you. and uh, and. We've made decisions, you know, in our tenure that have cost us money that have been in the best long-term interest of the company. And, um, you know, one thing I, I get really jealous about is the decisions that Frost makes during a crisis. Um, and um, I can remember one most angry I've been happened was around, I won't go into the details, was around a decision that had been made which I thought cheapened our value proposition of safety and soundness a bit. Not because we were doing anything, but, but because we weren't really using that to, to develop uh, some, some relationships. And, uh, and, and the thing that made me so upset was I said, you know, it matters what Frost Bank does during a crisis. And it matters so much because the people 
who are coming up under us are watching what we do. And the stories that they tell, that we tell today of what I saw in the 1980s and during these other, the great financial crisis where we didn't, first bank in the country not to take TARP, um, those are the stories these people are going to tell in the future. And they'll have their own stories of, of courage and wisdom uh, that, uh, that they employ. And, and so it's really important. And when you've been around 154 years, I mean, you're going to see some hard times. And um, you know, it's just part of life. It's part of business. Yeah, I think that's, that's beautifully said. Um, you mentioned a number of um, sort of flashpoint moments over the 154-year history. Um, you know, certainly, we're in a very, very dynamic moment uh, right now. Um, you know, with you know financial markets and inflation, and you know um, the digital transformation that's going on. That's certainly you know touching all aspects of the financial services industry. Can you talk about some of the some of, some of these either trends or or items and, and sort of get, help us get our mind around uh, you know that. Uh, that change and that disruption, you know, from, from the eyes of the CEO? Yeah, well, you know, <clears throat> <they're>, um, <clears throat> everybody's uh, impacted by disruption, right? It doesn't matter if you're running a hotel, you've got a taxi company, university. Um, <clears throat> it's all being disrupted by technology. Excuse me. And so it's nothing new. And I look back over the 42 years I've been with our company, and I've thought about, well, you know, it hasn't been so much all the time technology, but there's been a lot of disruption. I mean, think, go back and, and look at it. Branch, branch banking in Texas, as hard for, is it, as it is to believe, and, you know, we talked earlier, Dean, I think you're 46? Yeah. Okay. I said, We'll have some coffee sometime. I'll tell you about the old days. He said, oh, that's all right. I'll look it up in the Encyclopedia Britannica. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, branch banking, you know, revolutionized, you know, the capital investment for providing bank banking services in Texas. And it uh, was remarkable that we had to have a, a, a one more location to the board of directors and shareholders, and it was, it was crazy. It's insanity, right? The ATM machine revolutionized how cash was distributed in the economy. You know, the Merrill Lynch CMA account was revolutionary in, in, in what it did. Um, you, we can just, you know, go on and on, you know, mobile banking, internet banking, which is kind of an interesting idea 20 some, some odd years ago. You know, it's part of the warp and woof of what we do. So I'm not surprised by the continual change and, um, and I think the thing that as we address this, uh, you have to address it through a, from a cultural perspective. And, um, you know, I would say to all the businesses that are here and who, you know, are dealing with this, I would just, uh, all I know is how we've dealt with it, right? And I would just offer it to you as, you know, not as, um, as a commercial, but just as a case study that I happen to know a little bit about, right? Because I know something about this company. And um, I think the way that we've chosen to deal with technology is through an empathetic customer experience. If you look at our net promoter score, let's say, let's go back to 2016. Our net promoter score at that time was, was uh, 65, which is a great score. I, you know, how many people know what a net promoter score is? Just raise your hand. Okay, so there, there are a number that don't. I'm just telling you what it is. It's basically a score that measures how much someone's willing to recommend doing business with you. I'll take a little bit of license with this, but that's basically what it is. On a, score, a scale of one to 10, how, how likely are you <clears throat> to recommend doing business with somebody? They take the nines and the tens, and those are promoters. They take the sixes and under, and those are detractors. And they forget the, the middle piece, OK? So it's a pretty high bar. Nines or tens, subtract the sixes and unders. OK, so a, a score of 50 is world class. And you know we were sitting around 65. Not bad. but. If you looked five years later, 80. Wow. You know, and you're looking wow. at companies that have 
you know, you're looking at Apple's probably at mid 50s. Mm -hmm. You know, Amazon probably around the same same point. You know, there there's some great companies, and I'm not trying to say we're better. Than, I'm just just trying to put this within context, right? So if you look at from 2016 to 2021, and the distance we've put between some of these amazing technology companies, right? It has not been because of technology. Has our technology, is our technology good? Yeah, in some cases it's great. In some cases it's world class, but you'll never win the technology arms race. You will never do it. Facebook won't do it, <laughs> right? <clears throat> um, and you're also up against the most powerful and wealthy commercial enterprises really in history, right? So, you, you know, it's not about the arms race. It's about having good technology, being in the ballpark, which allows your people to respond to customers' needs. And again, you know, in J.D. Power, we're, you know, our mobile app is rated the highest of, you know, in the state. So I'm not saying, I don't, I'm not denigrating our technology at all. But you mix it with an empathetic customer experience, and that's where you win. That's what took that net promoter score from 65 to 80 is that combination. Yeah. And I, you know, I would hold that out to, to people with companies that are struggling with disruption and technology is people still want people who care about you as a person. And if you can have a culture that will not only <clears throat> not only be about that, but demonstrate that and put shoe leather on that, then that's a powerful combination. Yeah. It gives you the ability to basically neutralize technology and win on service. Yeah. That's how we approach it. Well, I love that. Um, obviously, you're in a very competitive industry, um, mm -hmm. doing very well in a sustained way. Um, and you know there are many uh, many players in that industry, traditional mm -hmm. banks as well as you know shadow banks or yep. you know people who are using you know, the blockchain and crypto to move money mm -hmm. and, and make investments. How do you how do you operate against that competitive landscape? You know, there's a lot of change going on. Like we said, there's been change. There'll continue to be some. You know, the, the headline uh, changes in financial services are around. Probably crypto is number one. Is, is, is what you hear most about. And that's a really interesting one. I think that um, as opposed to a transactional vehicle, it's more a store of value today. It's become an asset class. And it's one that, that banks are beginning to participate in. And uh, the interesting thing in the case of banks is <clears throat> there's very little regulatory guidance around it, either from the SEC, you know, what is it? Is it Security is it property? What you know? What is this thing? From the from the financial regulators, they really haven't defined what it is, uh, and really how it applies to banks. And as a result, we don't have the, the latitude to have certainty on how we approach the market. Uh, and we have plus thousands of regulations that we have to deal with with regard to know your customer, any money laundering, all these various responsibilities that we have. And we have to know how to integrate that in to the crypto world. At the same time, <clears throat> I believe the uh, Harris Poll said about 13% of the population in the United States has, crypt has crypto exposure. And so it's something that there's demand for. And we really want to participate in that because it's, it's a desire of our customers. And so we're working towards that. Where we stand today is that you're, you're able to aggregate the asset with your financial uh, overall profile on the mobile app and, and, and on our website. So you know, you're, you're able to do that. We saw ourselves moving into the ability to, to acquire it, our, allowing our customers to acquire it. And I think that's the second level. Also being a, a, um, a trusted source of information about it. That's one of the, the superpowers I think that we have as a company. And then ultimately um, determining if we want to be a custodial point for it, because I think there's a lot of trust that still in orders to the banking industry, certainly our company in the, that industry. And, and I think people are showing, since you see, I think it's PayPal and Square combined have more customers than Coinbase, which sort of tells me that 
that customers would rather keep these assets where they keep their other financial assets as opposed to a, a, a one-off piece. So I think there's space for the, for the banking industry in that area, and I think that um, we're finding our way, and it's, it's just a matter of time. I think another area that, that is, um, that's coming in the area of financial services is in, is in terms of the sort of open data, uh, you need the ability to have portability of data uh, as opposed to closed systems. I think we're, we're probably moving toward that over time. And uh, while data is, you, know, you say data is the new oil, right? And you hate somebody taking your oil. <laughs> we have a lot of people in this room that would hate that. But, uh, you know, that's, I think, ultimately going to be something that's coming. I personally believe that a company like ours, that will probably be a net benefit. Because when you're looking at a, you know, company that's look at third party evaluations of, of customer sentiment towards us, it tells you that, you know, when people understand who we are and what we do, um, they've been very, ha and they participate with us, they've been very happy. Thus, the net promoter scores, J.D. Power, Greenwich and Associates, those kinds of things. And um, so I tend to be optimistic about that. If it's easier for someone to bank with us, to have a relationship with us, uh, more than just banking, we do lots of things, I think it's probably a good thing for us. I think it's gonna make it more competitive and, uh, and we're certainly willing to compete on, on that basis. So I think that's something else you're seeing. There, there are other trends that you're seeing, but frankly, I think some of the trends that we most worry about today are really old school trends like Number one is the availability of talent. Yeah. Man, I have not seen this kind of war for talent in my career. The closest thing I think that comes to it was back in the late 70s when we had hyperinflation. This is the thing I was telling <laughs> Dean about. He was going to look up in the Encyclopedia Britannica. But the, uh, <clears throat> you know, that was, you know, if you weren't getting a 15% pay raise back then in the hyperinflation, you were doing something wrong. I mean, and, and that was unsustainable. For business and Paul Volcker came and killed it. We were in a, an, an, an asset liability management uh, meeting yesterday. We manage we, our bond portfolio is about 15 billion dollars, and we, we're responsible for managing that. And so we, we, you know, we pay attention to this stuff. And I and we were we were back, literally looking 40 years back at the Fed rate increases in the 70s, and. Uh, because the Fed is behind the curve, badly behind mm -hmm. the curve. We know that. And, uh, and the Fed, Fed was behind the curve then. And when you watch what Volcker had to do to kill inflation, it was, it was brutal. I looked, one of the Fed increases they had was 5%. Wow. You know, we were wondering, well, are they, you know, how many intermeeting inter moves have they had? There have been a couple of them in the last 15 years that, that we saw. But you were talking about periods of time that were really, really bad dislocations for business. And it started a 30-year you know, bull market in, in interest rates, right? Well, we've moved past that. And now we're seeing inflation. We're seeing it, uh, you know, inflation's, we don't like it. But to me, it's less about that. Because that has supply chain implications of that type of thing, chips and those kind of things. But you can make more chips, but it still takes 21 years to make a 21-year-old, you know? And you, <laughs> right? And you just can't clone them. And so, and, and there's four million jobs in this country that, that are not filled. And people are, you know, you've got to have people to, to succeed. We succeed. We did all those great things that you said. It's not, they're not because we've got buildings and lease obligations, it's because we have great people. A lot more around this room. We have great people. And unless you have talent, you can't compete. And it is, it is brutal what is going on, on out there. You know, the discussions we were having even two days ago are all around this and how you, uh, how you respond. Well, well, hopefully we can be part of a, uh, your solution you uh, have to, to, of talent. In fact, uh, some of you know this, not all of you do, but, uh, but Philip isn't heading back to the office right after this. He's actually going to spend a whole hour uh, with about a dozen of our top students and really talk about uh, career paths and you know, how to prepare 
uh, for a successful career uh, built in the context of life. And so thanks for making that investment in our students. Um, and, uh, and hopefully the tradition of us being a go-to source for talent for Frost will yeah, we'll continue. We'll continue to be. Yeah, well, I appreciate it. Well, we're working really, really hard um, from a curricular perspective to prepare for, for, for your reality. Um, some of you know that we were one of the first 10 business schools in the country to launch a formal certificate in FinTech, which includes uh, blockchain and crypto, mm -hmm. uh, AI, deep learning, machine learning, and other topics that we we're hopefully preparing, you know, the, you know, the banker of the future and the financial leader of the future. Um, and that's been uh, a very a, a tremendously popular uh, program, and so hopefully we're we're uh, preparing for the reality that that, that you're seeking. Um, one of the things that uh, struck me is we talk about innovation and technology and change and mobility and open data and all these trends. Um, is your growth uh, your your growth plan and your expectations? I think it was uh, you know double the number of locations in, in Houston and triple in, in in North Texas, which implies you know still investing you know on Main Street mm -hmm. through a branch model. Talk to us a little bit about the interplay uh, between technology and physical presence and, and why that's the right strategy for you. Right. Well, we made a decision, uh, it's been, I guess, four years ago or so, that we wanted to invest in the expan fiscal expansion of our network, in, uh, first in, in, in Houston, then we moved that to Dallas, and, and, um, and we've got great other markets. I, I should say Fort Worth is a great market for us, one of our largest lending markets, one of our largest deposit markets, and, and you know, as well as markets like San Antonio. But if you, if you, if you put in context, First of all, those two markets, let's say Dallas and Houston. <clears throat> in order for us to, to, to really perform on, on the long term like our shareholders need us to, um, we need to be deeper into those markets. I mean, to get your head around it, Houston by itself or Dallas by itself, forgive me for mentioning the name Dallas in the Fort Worth uh, <laughs> <laughs> location, but uh, each, each of those by themselves are 50% larger in deposits in round numbers than either the state of Arizona or the state of Colorado. Wow. So it gives you a, a, an idea of the size. It's, it's critical that we, we employ all of our uh, brand resources in those markets to be successful. And um, we, four years ago or so, there was a change in the regulatory rules, Senate Bill 2251, which removed this $50 billion cut line, tripwire, into this massive regulation that was the result of the great financial crisis. They moved it up to about 100 million, in some cases 100 billion, 250 billion and others. So there's a lot, a lot of runway for banks to grow without crossing this and incurring all these expenses. <clears throat> it, there's a lot of talk around, do you, does, does that mean that acquisitions are back on the table? Is that what the deal was? Uh, and our view in looking at it was, um, because we had made investments in technology and we'd made investments in value proposition and lowering the barriers to entry for customers to come to us from the, what we call the too big to fail, the, the very largest institutions. And we were experiencing growth. We, we, we did see organic growth there. We decided to make the investment with our income statement as opposed to our balance sheet, as opposed to making acquisitions, which we've made a lot of, and, and I've made a lot of them personally, you know, as CFO over the years for the company. But uh, we decided to, to grow organically because we were able to grow. And, uh, and we knew that um, physical locations were still important in, in markets. <clears throat> and so uh, we, we undertook that, that effort and uh, the market hated it. <laughs> they usually hate everything that's long term. But, um, you know, the, 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 it's like, Phil, don't you understand? You know, the banks are closing branches and not increasing branches, uh, you know. I remember telling our board the, the day before we made the announcement, I said, expect us to lose 3% versus the index tomorrow. And, and the math was simple, you know. Our CFO was gonna say what the burn was for the first year. You take the PE, you put it on it, and there's 3%, and it's exactly what happened. Uh, but, but it was a strategy that we knew that we've been able to perform on, um, and that if we were just able to do the average of the last 40 locations we opened in the last eight years, it would be a tremendous success. And it's, and it's actually been more successful than we anticipated doing it. We knew that in RFPs with businesses that 
70, 80 percent of the RFPs ask the question, where is your nearest physical location? And, it, um, and, it's, and it's important to understand what it isn't. It's almost as important to understand what it isn't as to understand what it is. What it is not, it's not a retail transaction processing strategy. It is a projection of our brand into communities. It's putting Frost bankers on the ground near businesses where they can engage and win on a relationship basis. And if you look at what versus our pro formas, we're 180% roughly of our loan pro formas, 120% of our deposit pro formas, and 140, 50% of our relationship pro formas. So it's, it's been successful. The profitability is driven primarily by the commercial business. 70% of the profitability comes from the commercial side, and that's, you know, um, that's really been successful for us. And uh, the, the consumer business, the wealth management business, and even insurance business play into that. That's 30%, which is important. But it's really in that middle market and small business component, which is our wheelhouse, yeah. that's allowed us to, to, to excel. So it's been, um, it's, it's been a very successful strategy for us, and one that as we apply it in, apply it in North Texas, we're, we're really confident that it'll be successful. Yeah, and again, very consistent with your culture and um, core values and, and playing for the long term, even if it's um, antithetical to current market sentiment. <laughs> um, you know, for, you know, you're a business school, right? So I was, my question was, why is the market taking the zero cost, you know, the zero cash flow, and they're not giving <laughs> anything to those future cash flows, right? Absolutely. And I get it. It's like, you know, it, it's, it's a show-me market, and you need to, you need to perform. But, uh, but I, to, to the market's credit, I think they've seen the, the myth in of it, and they've recognized it. Yeah, that's great. Now, I know you're deeply uh, committed to Texas, very Texas-centric in, in, in so many ways. Um, as you think about growth, whether it's organic or otherwise, um, would you ever consider a play outside of Texas? We would. I mean, the short answer is yes. Uh, you know, we're, <clears throat> I think our value proposition resonates, you know, it, it crosses the Red River, you know, it, cro it, it crosses geographical, you know, lines. And um, I mean, it's basically an empathetic customer service experience with great technology. Who didn't want that, right? And so, now, is it something that we are, is on the radar to do, you know, in the near term? No. And the reason is, just like I said, Houston's 50% bigger than Colorado and in Arizona. Dallas, the same thing. I mean, we have an incredible opportunity to leverage our brand in this state. And, and if, as you move beyond those markets, you know, Austin is growing like crazy. San Antonio is going to be great as well. But I mean, and, and, and the other places that we are, we're, we're continuing to invest in all those markets, but we're, we're working hard to rationalize a, a stronger uh, distribution network in those, in those major ones. It's going to take us some time to do that. But I think, uh, you know, over time, you'll see us uh, be able to move into other markets that, that are high growth markets that have good commercial prospects and good commercial centers of gravity that will be able to leverage that value proposition. I'm, the thing I love about the strategy that we have right now, it's very durable, it's very scalable. Yep. Well, um, you mentioned you know, your wheelhouse with you know, small, medium enterprises. Um, a lot of that kind of was on full display, and I think you received a ton of national accolades and attention for what you did with PPP loans. Can you talk to us about that, that moment, that strategy, some of the, um, the results you've seen as a result? You know, <clears throat> PPP was an amazing time. It, um, and I think the efforts that of our bankers, I have two words for it, historic and heroic. No historical precedent for what they did, none. And I had people tell, I remember a woman saying, she said, you know, I never thought that the decision 13 years ago where I opened a checking account would be an existential decision. Because she was able to get a PPP loan when she, her business needed it. And if she hadn't gotten it, she would have failed. And, and it was really because our, our, our employees were able to, because of our culture that represents going above and beyond and they did 
uh, that allowed us just the grit. And, and technology was a, was a part of it. You know, we used robotic process automation on the fly. We used digital signature on the fly. We used API-based uh, interfaces, all those kinds of things. But it was the grit of our bankers working night and day, seven days a week with in humility supporting each other that, that did it. It was, it was amazing. But I'll tell you this. Um, you know, you, you think back, okay, it was, a, it was an amazing program. It was courageous, creative. Uh, they had $350 billion they were going to give out, and they were going to give it out until June 30th or when the money ran out. Okay, it started at, I think, eight, you know, the 1st of April. 13 days later, the money ran out. It was an Oklahoma land rush, yeah. right? <laughs> yep. And, uh, <clears throat> And we, uh, I remember the second day of, of, as we were doing this, you know, remotely, right, in COVID from home, and uh, I, I thought I was witnessing the most colossal failure in the 152-year history of our company. And the reason was, you know, we had, not because we hadn't prepared, we had done all tons of work. We had stood up a website portal, Taken applications, we had we had increased our number of SBA system logins from six. We normally have to 86. We had you know done lots of work, uh, smart people, but um, but first of all, that first day, in the first 12 hours, we took in 3,000 applications. Okay, now put it in perspective. We we process about 900 commercial loans a month. Wow. 3,000 in the wow. first 12 hours. The next day was a Saturday, 1,500 additional applications. You know how many applications we got processed through the SBA that first day? Three. You know I mean the second day? 63. Wow. We were faced with a tsunami of applications, and those SBA, those SBA logins, none of them worked. <laughs> we, were, we were faced a tsunami of, of applications coming in with the six old SBA logins. And, you know, I was thinking what we were going to say to our customers when the money ran out, we weren't able to, you know, to, to, to acquire this critical funding for them. And I was literally having a Zoom meeting with my executive team. It was 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And I was talking to them about this for them to just, you know, hey, we, just, we can just do the best we can do. And at the, the corner of my screen, this email, notice shows up. It's the most beautiful email. It said, all of a sudden, the SBA logins all seem to be working. And I don't know if it was a divine intervention, a congressional you know, call, whatever, but it gave us the opportunity. It gave us a fighting chance. And it allowed the, our culture to come to the rescue. And I felt like being on the beach at Dunkirk and seeing those boats come <laughs> across the channel. And because our bankers volunteered 500 of them, you know, you had investment professionals, auditors, lenders, accountants, raising their hands and let me be a part of this. Just, just let me be a part of it. And, uh, and together with all those things we did, and then, you know, you had, we made, what was it? The first, the first few, first 13 days, we did what, 11,000 loans or something? And we had to close them. We had to close them in 10 days. So we had to figure that out, how that would happen in COVID when you couldn't meet with somebody yep. in person. It was just an amazing thing to watch. And the last thing I'll say about it is that <clears throat> I could not have commanded that kind of performance. I couldn't have done it. But it happened organically. It grew up organically from the soil of our culture. Uh, I love Historic. It. Heroic. Historic and heroic. You know, to put it in perspective, one other thing, we were about pound for pound, ten, almost 10 times the level of, of PPP funding of the largest institutions. So, you know, what our people were, were able to do pound for pound was just, just amazing. Yeah. Well, um, we have a lot of questions okay, from sorry, the crowd, uh, so we're gonna we're gonna try. Okay. Uh, the I first one, I, the first one I've got, yeah, it might be a lightning round here. Um, yeah. The uh, the first one's up from an incoming MBA student, which I love. Um, wants to know the diff 
difference between the DFW North Texas market expansion and the Houston market expansion? Is it, is it the same playbook in both markets? Are they so d distinct that you approach them in different ways? The short answer is it's, it's basically the same playbook, but we've learned things. You know, it's the second half of the game, right? You've gone in, you've seen what the, what the game plan is, and you know what changes you have to make. So it is, it's, the same, it's the same game plan with, with some adjustments. Uh, I think that the, <clears throat> the Dallas market is going to be um, different in some ways, uh, just because you know, Houston and Dallas are different. But it's, um, it is a very diverse market from a business point of view. Houston has, a, has higher energy concentration, so I think you know, what we're able to do with middle and, and small business uh, customers might actually be a little bit more opportunity in Dallas. So, um, I, I, but I think we'll be very similar. Okay. Uh, sticking on the community theme, um, the next one is just around your approach to community outreach and partnering um, you know, with the communities that you serve and how you incorporate that into your, your strategy. Well, we, uh, we identify um, as we put a location in a market, in a sub-market, let's say, uh, we, the person that runs it for us is called a community leader. And their responsibility is to engage with the community, um, become known, become an, an entity there. We have, you know, spaces in our locations which are beautiful, <coughs> which are able to be used as community room. So we invite uh, communities to come in and use the space. Uh, and it's, so it's all about being a part of the community uh, in a granular way. And so that's, you're really describing our strategy. Yeah. Um, speaking of communities and, um, and oftentimes what makes them strong is, um, you know, a robust housing market. Um, a question is around both the Texas and U.S. housing markets and um, also your reentry into the mortgage market. Well, <clears throat> As far as the Texas and, and U.S. housing market, it's amazing, right? It's the, the best market I've ever seen. I also don't think it's sustainable. Um, and it's been driven, you know, some too much accommodation in some ways. But there are, there are other societal factors that, that I mean, uh, I've got a rent house in Austin, and you won't believe the tax valuation I just got on that thing. It was amazing. That's unsustainable. But the... Uh, uh, so I think you know, there'll be some moderation on that, right? But with regard to our movement back into the mortgage business, you know, we were in it uh, 20 years ago plus, uh, and we're really not getting into the mortgage business. We, we were sort of in the business then. We're offering a mortgage product, and there's a difference. Um, we, uh, the approach today would be much more branch-centric. <clears throat> It'd be much more purchase money centric, and it's much more experiential centric to give the Frost Bank world class customer service experience to somebody who's undertaking one of the largest financial transactions for most people that they ever have, which is buy, buying a home. And I think we can be that that um, that trusted advisor through that process. And and you know we'll we'll balance sheet, we'll put the loans on our balance sheet, we'll do the servicing, which means you can call. Someone to pick up the phone, no call tree. You know that's how we that's how we do things. So I think we're going to give the market a great experience. Uh, there are basically five more uh, consumer real estate products. We do four of them. We just don't do the mortgage product. I haven't done it for for five, for 20 years. We've had a lot of demand for it for customers uh, from customers, and we're going to enter into that market. Uh, one of the things that's a big difference from where it was 20 some odd years ago is technology. The technology is much more scalable. You're able to enter at a smaller, uh, smaller uh, level in terms of volume, but then scale that up very efficiently in cloud-based and, and SaaS-based platforms to do that. Whereas before, you had to have the scale to maintain the systems in place to be competitive with the big mortgage providers. You don't have to do that any longer. Yeah. And it, one of the really neat things about it is it gives us the opportunity, and you don't get this chance very often, to curate the absolute best technology in the marketplace to provide your value proposition and your customer experience. And that's great. When you take a customer experience company like ours and put them in the candy store of UK, you get to pick the best technology and integrate it the way you want for the best customer experience. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, that's, that's great. Speaking of fun, this question's great. Um, what do you think the prospects of a digital dollar are, and do you think there's ever a time when physical currency uh, bills and coins will be called by the government? 
you know, I, I don't think the government wants a digital dollar. I mean, they, um, I, you know, I was on the Federal Advisory Council for four years, and, you know, I, I, I didn't sense a groundswell of, of support for that. It, it, it mostly revolves in the cases of their studies around providing, you know, banking services to, to somewhat unbanked people is, is really where the, where the, where it, the rubber meets the road in, I think, some of their efforts. But, you know, I think we're going to see you know, more digital deployment in the world. It's just going to happen. But, the, but, but governments don't want to lose control of fiat currency. It's too, it's too important for them. So I think there will be headwinds against losing that ability to maintain that, that um, seniorage of their cu currency. Um, this one is uh, back to commercial lending. Um, uh, obviously, it's a main profit generator, 70%. Um, are there certain industries that you're seeing you know, st a relative strength in or, or weaknesses as you look at the broader portfolio? Actually, we've seen very broad uh, support. We saw the um, decline in lending, particularly the commercial and industrial piece. You know, because think about it. I mean. Supply chain problems, you know, people not, you know, out, you, you refinance accounts receivable inventory, right? Well, inventories were really low, accounts receivable were down because sales were down. So, so just the natural demand for credit was, was went down consistently for, gosh, you know, how, what was it, over a year. Mm -hmm. And then it turned in, um, in June of last year. And then we've seen it go up consistently since then. And we really, um, and commercial real estate, same way. And then even consumer. Uh, so we've seen broad demand for credit, and, uh, and we're beginning to see utilization of lines of credit increase, which tells us that there's, you know, there's more economic activity, and people are willing to, to, to borrow to expand their business. But we're still not where we need to be, and we'll, we're still moving forward. But what, what we have seen is really very broad demand. Uh, and a related question, just specific to your thoughts on uh, the energy industry and specifically oil and gas and, and what, you're, what, what, what trends you're seeing there, given our current circumstances? Well, it's nice to see the price in a way. <laughs> when I've been at the pump, it's nice to see the price where it is. But it's, but it's an unusual time. You know, our customers tell us that um, it's, um, you're not seeing lease prices uh, increase that much. Um, someone was telling me uh, just out front that you're seeing, you know, you, the price for royalties is really high, but, but lease prices for development are not, haven't changed that much. Uh, also, uh, some of our operators tell us that it's very difficult for them to increase production today. And it's the first time, one told us it was the first time in their history that they haven't been able to deploy their cash flow back into development to the extent they want to. And the reason is because they don't have access to the raw materials uh, to actually generate production. It could be sand, it could be downhole pipe availability, it could, it could be truck drivers, it could be just general labor. Those things make it difficult. And so the, you know, I think the outlook for our expansion of, of production here in the U.S. is going to be challenged a bit with what we, what we have. Yeah, and uh, supply chain issues everywhere. Yeah. Um, certainly, even even with the frothiness of the moment. Um, okay, well, we uh, we promised to get you out of here by nine. Uh, we've covered a, a tremendous uh, number of pastures today. Uh, just such a, a wonderful story of a first generation college student, you know, applying um, not only intellect but uh, a strong sense of of, of core values um, and rising to the top of one of the most amazing financial services organizations that I've ever seen. Um, a lot of talk around culture um, and it being enduring and endurable um, and making decisions for the long term, uh, not just uh, for uh, near term expediency um, and how you um, uh, adhere to that during unexpected moments, times of crisis and what that says about you and the loyalty that you engender by being a customer centric organization. Um, a great deal of coverage on you know the trends, whether that's you know crypto or open data, the war for talent. Um, I love the fact that it takes 21 years old to make a 21 year old. Um, that's so true. Yeah. Uh, so you know that's that's good for business schools. Um, uh, I love the just unpacking the notion of of investing directly and physically in a community and that being bound up in this in, in your strategy. Um, regardless of you know the state of play of technology um, and then um, 
um, the, the testimonial around the grit and the historic and heroic effort of, of your team as, as applied against the backdrop of your culture. Um, I, I know everyone knew a bit about Frost walking in, but I think you know everything you need to know about Frost walking out. So thank you, thank you, thank you for being um, here uh, for our capstone final exam uh, attendee executive speaker series. We've had a great year, and I couldn't think of a better way to end it. But let's all thank Philip one more time. Thank you.